All right, so why are we here? Uh, obviously, you would not be here, and we are all here because we care about housing and housing affordability in the Bay Area. The simple answer to why this issue is so critical is that we have a housing shortage in California. And with that sh housing shortage comes high housing prices. With high housing prices, affordability is lost. One of the biggest reasons for our housing shortage is the way cities and counties over the last 50 years or so have developed land use rules for housing. We in California have done a really good job in making housing very difficult and expensive to build. And this may show up as restrictive rules on where apartment buildings can be built as opposed to single family homes, about how tall buildings can be, about what fees developers need to pay in order to build a building, what parking requirements are, et cetera. The more difficult it is to build, build a building, the more expensive. And we see the consequences of these high building costs, not enough housing. Between 2015 and 2021, cities and counties across the Bay Area permitted only 35% of the affordable homes needed, according to the state of California. And then woven into the issue of how expensive it is to build is the problem of adequate public funding for affordable housing. And when I refer to affordable housing, I'm uh, referring to uh, typically deed restricted housing that is supported by governmental financial assistance for people who otherwise cannot afford to buy or rent market rate housing. So for example, it's housing for low wage workers, for seniors on fixed incomes, or people living with disabilities. Uh, truly affordable housing has always uh, typically required some level of governmental assistance we had a period of strong housing support at the federal governmental level in the late 1960s and 70s. But starting in the 1980s, that housing safety net at the federal level was significantly reduced. And this means while there's a great need and there's political will too at our state and local levels, there just aren't enough resources to meet both the demand and those high costs. Last year, uh, BAFA commissioned a pipeline study of all the affordable housing in the region that was in some stage of pre-development. That is, the housing was preparing for construction at some point, um, but hadn't yet broken ground and hadn't secured all the funding that it needed to start building. We found almost 33,000 homes in the survey that could start work right away if they had all the funding secured. And then finally, there's a third strand of our affordable housing problem that's also integrally tied to the first two elements, and that is widening income inequality in the Bay Area. So we have one brief statistic for you to consider. Between 2010 and 2019, median household income for the top 10% of Bay Area income earners increased 87%. Incomes for the bottom 10% of income earners increased only 4%. And what this all means is that there's a growing number of households in the Bay Area that can afford very high housing costs and a growing number of households for whom just paying the rent is really rough. And as of 2020, there were about three and a half million Bay Area residents. This is getting close to half of all Bay Area residents that were low or very low income. Also, it's even more complicated because we have racial equity issues at play here. People of color are disproportionately impacted with these issues. Next slide, please. So what are the consequences? Number one, a lack of affordable housing equals homelessness. There is no debate about that. <clears throat> there were almost 37,000 unhoused people in the Bay Area in 2022. And a lack of affordable housing means there are hundreds of thousands of people on the brink of homelessness. Almost 600,000 people in the Bay Area are a paycheck away or a healthcare crisis away from homelessness. It means displacement from communities, whether to the edges of our Bay Area cities, um, uh, sorry, phone, I should have turned that off. <laughs> um, that's given rise to a growing number of super commuters, 
or people who have to move out of the state altogether. Housing unaffordability means fewer and fewer people can own homes. And this adds to economic strain as more people pay rents, which go up year over year, um, as opposed to paying a fixed mortgage for it with a 30 year term where you're also building equity. And you may have seen this, our local newspapers recently published new survey results showing that only 23% of people in the Bay Area aged 23 to 35 own a home. And this is the lowest rate in the nation. Also, of course, working people, if they can't afford to live near their jobs, then businesses have trouble attracting and retaining workers. This has detrimental effects on communities, and especially when it comes to uh, essential workers like teachers and healthcare workers. Uh, next slide, please. So how are we thinking about this planning at the regional level? Uh, first, we have to acknowledge our interdependence as a region. We live, work, and socialize without reference to county boundaries. And also there have been tremendous efforts undertaken recently by individual cities and counties to raise housing money for their own jurisdictions. And while this has generated some great work, uh, those single efforts have not budged the unaffordability trends that we face. The state declared that the Bay Area must plan for 180,000 new affordable homes built by 2031. And this means that every city and county in the region is in the process of submitting their plans, which are called housing elements, to meet this mandate. Many of these housing elements have been approved by the state, but many more are still in process. But that mandate, 180,000 new affordable homes, is so significant that together we need to create new resources to meet the demand. And we can do this by building partnerships, by approaching our issues regionally, and working together instead of competing against each other for scarce housing resources. We can make our system better. Next slide, please. BAFA's mission. This is really the reason that the state legislature created BAFA in 2019 to address these regional housing issues, to address housing issues regionally. Uh, we have the power to raise new revenue for all nine counties and to create better housing finance uh, and development programs uh, generally. We are working on new housing construction. We're working to help people stay in their homes rather than facing displacement. We're working on programs to help protect tenants at risk of losing their homes and facing homelessness. These are the three Ps, production, preservation, and protections. And we're doing this in close collaboration with cities and counties. We have two governing boards, the Association of Bay Area Governments Executive Board and the BAFA Board. And that board is comprised of the same membership as the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. And then in addition, uh, we have the benefit of a nine member advisory committee, which is uh, comprised of uh, experts in the field. So we have broad representation from across the Bay Area in our leadership. And in addition to working according to the rules established at the state legislature and with our uh, regional leadership, we're guided by an equity framework that we created to ensure that all of our work centers on equity and to the greatest extent possible, we can deliver resources to those who need it most. Next slide, please. Okay, so we just have two more background slides uh, before we go to questions and uh, move to the housing bond discussion. We wanted to provide this graphic to show in a very, very simple terms, how we go from the idea of needing and wanting more housing to actual housing that is built that people can live in. Um, this is a graphic for how market rate rental housing gets built. And the process starts at the city uh, or county level where zoning ordinances apply. Those codes say what and where you can build. And then developers raise the money or they may already have the money to buy the land. They submit a building permit application and then they raise more money from lenders and investors typically to build the building. Once that building is complete, the developer and owner of the building 
charges tenants uh, market rate rents. And those rents pay back lenders, they pay back investors. Uh, the owner uses the rents to cover operating expenses like janitorial services, insurance, et cetera. And uh, if all goes well, the developer makes some money. Next slide, please. This is a similar graphic for how affordable housing gets built. And you'll see it gets a little more complicated. We start again with the city or county and their zoning codes, where and what you can build. Um, but then the developer usually has to go to a public sector agency to secure a commitment for or the money for the acquisition of that land. And this can take time. And there are many sellers who aren't interested in waiting around for the developer to line up their funding for affordable housing. So the number of parcels affordable developers can actually buy does become more limited. But once the developer figures out the acquisition funding, they then can submit their building permit application by the land, but they then have to go to apply for many additional funding sources from the public sector to construct the building. They almost always use a program called low-income housing tax credits. Um, it's an expensive and kind of difficult program to administer um, but it is the main vehicle all across the nation by which affordable developers build uh, affordable buildings. Meanwhile, the costs of holding on to that land can rack up while the developer is building that financing uh, stack. I've seen developments where there were eight or 10 sources of funds. It can get quite complicated and take a long time. Then finally, the developer gets all the money, if they're lucky, <laughs> they need to build the building. Um, they go forth, uh, it is constructed, and then the rents are set at below market rates, and they're set according to the rules that all those financing agencies set forth. And so this puts a lot of pressure on the building. It's a lot of risk because if the developer runs into a problem, like say right before construction is about to start, interest rates spike, or the cost of lumber goes way up, and we actually have seen those two things happen in recent years, well, you're not going to raise rents to cover those extra expenses. A developer may have to go back to the public sector to get more money, and that can often lead to an ongoing cycle that is difficult. Also, um, it's worth noting that for developers who seek to provide housing for homeless households, it's a really important type of affordable development for our communities. They also have to get an, a long-term operating subsidy, like Section 8, for example. That's something that most people are familiar with. Those resources are quite scarce, and it's one of the reasons uh, that we don't have enough housing for our unhoused residents. And then finally, if banks are involved, they want their return, they want all their money paid back with interest, and this just puts more pressure on the developers and their public sector partners. So it take, it's a lot of work, it takes time, and it's risky. Let's go to the um, big ticket item for our talk tonight, and that's the proposed regional bond measure. 10 to $20 billion to invest in affordable housing across the Bay Area. It requires voter approval and funds will be dispersed over a period of about 10 years because affordable housing, as we reviewed in that um, very simple graphic, it takes a minute or five <laughs> to develop. Uh, and we don't wanna have funding out there that is not getting spent quickly. Next slide, please. So this is just a refresher. Uh, what is a general obligation bond? GO bonds, as they're also known, are issued by the government for the purpose of providing essential public needs like affordable housing. They're purchased by investors and then property owners repay those investors with interest through an increase in their annual property tax payments. Currently, voters must approve a GEO bond issuance by a two-thirds margin. And uh, the cost of the BAFA bond to taxpayers, I know this is a really important question, 
It's a function of interest rates applicable at the time that the bonds are issued and then how fast we disperse the money. Um, but currently we do have some projections that we're using uh, for a $10 billion bond. The cost would be, uh, according to current conditions, about $10, $10 per $100,000 of a property's assessed value. So this translates into about $100 per year for a property with an assessed value of $1 million. And remember that assessed value does not equal market value. So I think homeowners and property owners out there who've had their properties for some time, uh, it is highly likely that your assessed value is quite a bit lower than your market value. Note that bonds are a tried and true, tried and true method for raising the money necessary to make large public investments. And they're used by communities all across the country. Next slide, please. This slide shows the actual dollar value uh, that would go to jurisdictions for both a $10 billion bond in light green and a $20 billion bond in dark green. These values are set by the amount property owners in each jurisdiction would contribute to the bond. And that's calculated based on the assessed property values of that jurisdiction. What's important to remember here is that for the first time, as you can see, every county would receive an unprecedented amount of funding. And we as a region for the first time would be working together to address our housing needs. Next slide. A question of obvious importance is how the money from a successful bond measure would be spent. The answers are defined in uh, BAFA's founding state legislation. And that legislation says that 80% of all funds that we raise return to the cities and counties of origin based on how much their property owners contribute to the bond. And that is, again, those green numbers that we just looked at, and it's the assessed property values that are the defining calculation for the uh, return to source, as we call it, the 80% of funds returning to the counties. The region's three biggest cities, San Jose, San Francisco, and Oakland, will receive a direct allocation of funds. And then there are cities that carry the obligation of needing to build 30% or more of their county's housing obligation for very low income residents. That's the RENA housing obligation that we were just talking about. Those cities have the option to get a direct allocation of funds also. And they are the city of Napa and Santa Rosa. And then BAFA retains the remaining 20% of funds raised for distribution in the region. That is, we'll be making investments all across the region with those 20% of funds. The rationale for BAFA retaining funds is to allow through regional governance, prioritization of projects that are innovative and efficient and can, and can control costs. This will mean more of the housing that we all need. And then second, and very importantly, BAFA's retention of money for investments around the Bay will allow over time for BAFA to become a self-sustaining financing agency that eventually can invest the interest and fees that we earn on loans back into communities, back into projects. And this would be very different than how it works right now when banks make loans on affordable housing developments and they take interest and fees, but they distribute those interest and fees to their shareholders. Next slide, please. Dropping down from that 80-20 split of the funding to the next level of spending requirements, both BAFA and the cities and counties must spend most of their funds, at least 52% on new construction or production. And then this goes to the arena question we talked about uh, previously. Cities and counties have to prioritize those new construction um, investments for extremely low, very low, and low income households, uh, the housing that will serve those households. And finally, all of BAFA's money must, for production, must be spent on rental housing. 
but cities and counties can build either rental housing or affordable, affordable home ownership developments. Next slide. Continuing on with the spending requirements, BACA's legislation requires at least 15% of all the funds to be spent on pres the preservation of affordable housing, uh, what Somea spoke to earlier. The goal here with this minimum of 15% investment is to stop the displacement of tenants because the rent has got just too high. So preservation investments can mean buying buildings on the market and converting them to permanently affordable housing. It can also mean saving housing that has an existing affordability restriction, but it's about to expire. And when that happens, it is often the case that the low income tenants in that building overnight can face a huge rent increase. And then preservation dollars can also be used to fix up existing affordable housing that has some disrepair. Next slide. At least 5% of funds must be allocated to tenant protections uh, according to our state legislation. This includes activities like rental assistance and legal services for low income tenants. However, um, there is an important asterisk to the, this 5% protection spending requirement. And that is that currently the California constitution only allows general obligation bonds to be used for, and I quote, the acquisition and improvement of real property. Those are the exact words in the constitution. Um, we also refer to this as quote, bricks and sticks. That means you can use geo bond money to buy land, to build a building, to fix up a building, and that's it. Uh, however, and this is also really important to know, there's currently an effort underway uh, by housing stakeholders across the state to amend the constitution to make the uses of geo bonds slightly more flexible so that communities can better address homelessness with things like rental assistance and services dollars. And so if that amendment were to pass, then the region could spend their 5% protections money on new activities that the constitutional amendment would allow. Next slide. Finally, the last piece of the pie for cities and counties is flexible funds. And for the jurisdictions, 28% of the funds that they receive may be spent on housing production, on housing preservation, or housing related uses like infrastructure to support housing or neighborhood amenities like parks and utility upgrades, anything that is housing related. Uh, BACA has an 18% flexible fund, but we are a little more restricted in our uses. We have to spend it only on production preservation. And if it's constitutional, we could also spend that on protections. Next slide. And now this is the last uh, spending piece. BAPA has an additional spending opportunity, and that's to use 10% of our funds to create a local government incentive grant program. And the possibilities here are really broad. Uh, we can include things like affordable home ownership programs, infrastructure for housing, one-time homelessness interventions, pretty much anything that is housing related, as long as it's constitutional and it meets some other uh, minimalist requirements in our legislation, we'll be working with our leadership on uh, what the best use of those funds uh, may be. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, BAFA is governed by its board and the ABAG executive board working together. They're both comprised of elected officials from around the region. BAFA staff and our MTC ABAG colleagues are working now with, and we will continue to work closely with the jurisdictions. One example of this coordination is that every city and county getting a direct allocation of funds must submit an expenditure plan to BAFA for approval by the BAFA boards. Uh, the BAFA boards will confirm that those expenditure plans are in compliance with the legislation. And right now we're providing technical assistance to the counties to help them with their outreach to their cities because all the cities and all the counties must be consulted as part of the expenditure planning. 
We're also working with the jurisdictions to help in other ways, like providing template materials for presentations to city councils and boards of supervisors, outreach and communication plans. And after the bond passes and funding begins, BAFA will coordinate reporting of our progress and the progress of all the jurisdictions throughout the region on an annual basis. Our goal is to be, not our goal, but our, we know we will be uh, very transparent about the work that we and the jurisdictions are doing. We'll post progress reports and expenditure plans on our website. We are required to report to the state legislature every year on our progress. And of course, we'll continue to work with uh, in communities and with communities and report to our governing boards. Next slide. And as we begin to wrap up here, I wanna to return to the question of how BAFA and a regional bond can achieve better results than what we're doing now for affordable housing as a region. Again, to have all of our region working together on affordable housing needs with significant new resources would be unprecedented and so powerful. BAFA will use its money to build more cost-effective housing so that we can increase housing supply and better meet, meet the needs of our residents. And then over time, BAFA can reinvest the interest and fees that we earn from loans back into communities and eventually provide housing subsidies without additional taxpayer support. And by investing in projects that serve those who need it most and with a focus on location and building design, that achieves environmental sustainability, BAFA can and will throughout pursue social and environmental justice goals. Next slide. How much housing are we talking about? Uh, another really important question. With a $10 billion bond, BAFA and our region can add between 35,000 and 40,000 affordable homes for the Bay Area that otherwise would not be built. And you can double that for a $20 billion bond. These are the kinds of investments that can truly make a difference and start to unwind the things that we talked about earlier tonight that have led us to this time of such great housing need. As you will see, and as we've mentioned uh, a couple of times tonight, we have some meetings coming up, public meetings to fine tune and uh, get final answers for our planning, uh, the bond, how BAFA will be uh, spending our plans, our, sorry, our money. <laughs> also, uh, again, we are working with the jurisdictions on their expenditure planning process, and that will um, be a little farther out because the jurisdiction's expenditure plans will not be due uh, for BAFA review until after the bond has passed. But um, we hope that the process will start soon. So stay tuned for in your community for those meetings as well. Uh, but you see here, uh, we have a meeting schedule at mtc.ca.gov backslash housing bond. You can sign up for the BAFA mailing list, uh, visit our website to learn more. And then any feedback, additional feedback, questions, follow up, BAFA at bayareametro.gov. And we really appreciate your participation. Again, it's essential. We are very appreciative. And I think that with that, it's a wrap.